so that we can get started. Um, start the slideshow. Um, how's everybody holding up in these times? Don't be afraid to use the uh, use the chat or unmute yourself if you have any questions or comments during the presentation. I um, just really appreciate everyone uh, being here uh, and and being a part of this pre presentation. So, all right. I'm just going to scoot this over so we can kind of see what we're doing here. <laughs> Day by day, how are you? Doing okay? Uh, I'm an Working intern. from home, I agree. Yep. I'm an intern, so I'm uh, filling up on trainings. Yeah. <laughs> it's that time, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, being able to attend a conference like this, uh, I wonder how many folks are in their pajamas attending the conference. That doesn't happen <laughs> very often. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you today uh, some of the information that I have learned uh, in the process of my dissertation. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, my name is uh, James or Jamie Smith. Most people just call me Jamie. Um, uh, I am a licensed professional counselor, NCC, ACS, Alphabet Soup. Um, I am also a PhD candidate. Um, I have completed my dissertation, received all of my approvals, and my degree will be conferred. Um, the at uh, um, on May 10th at the end of this academic term. So I have received all of the stuff and of everything that I've done uh, working on my PhD, the wait, thank you everyone. <laughs> uh, the waiting is the worst, but I, I say that jokingly because it really wasn't. Um, my PhD work was specifically, uh, it was a uh, qualitative study um, interpretive phenomenological analysis, if you want to try to say that 10 times real fast, um, working with uh, adult male survivors um, of uh, child sexual abuse, and specifically their experiences of disclosure, which is, I'm going to be sharing some of the information I've learned and uh, uh, from my study with you. So today, um, I am the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment at Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. Uh, we are a historically black college university. Um, extraordinarily proud of our university. Um, Lincoln was founded by veterans of the Civil War and specifically the 62nd and 65th Colored Regiments in the Civil War. So these were escaped slaves from Missouri that joined the Union Army um, got stationed in Texas. They would sit around the campfire at night and their commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Richard Baxter Foster, um, taught them how to read. And they realized we have to offer this opportunity to other, uh, to our brothers and sisters once this war has ended and, and uh, we have obtained our freedom. So they donated their salaries. Many of them donated up to a year's salary to be able to um, purchase the land upon which was founded Lincoln Institute, uh, specifically for the purpose of educating the freed slaves after the Civil War. So we're very proud of our heritage and our history at Lincoln University. So, um, and I have the privilege of working there. Um, I'm also a husband and a father. And uh, so those are my little rapscallions and my beautiful wife. And I am a dog owner, that's my dog trooper. So um, that's that's who I am, and I get to know. I'm looking forward to get to knowing to getting to know some of you uh, during the course of this hour that we're going to spend together. Um, so what I want to do is take a global look at the experience of disclosure, specifically for adult male survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some barriers to disclosure. Um, we're going to look at some universal barriers for all survivors of child sexual abuse. We're also going to look at barriers that are specific to adult male survivors. Um, we're going to look at uh, some of the traditional understandings of disclosure that it informed how mental health professionals receive disclosure. We're also going to look at why these traditional understandings, the paradigms we currently use, are, are lacking. And then uh, I hope we can kind of shift the paradigm uh, of understanding disclosure to something 
that more closely uh, matches the lived experiences of survivors. So that's, that's what I hope we're going to do today. These are some of the universal barriers to disclosure. One is the bad guy myth. The bad guy myth is that sexual abuse is committed by bad people. Um, and I say that and people are like, well, you mean it's not? Of course it is. But it is not committed by strangers, by someone who is this very obvious, sleazy kind of perpetrator. The vast majority of sexual abuse is committed by someone that the child already knows. That is, and, and I'm not saying anything that anyone doesn't know, but the more that we talk about things like stranger danger, um, the, the less um, we, uh, yeah, 80.5% rain statistic, absolutely. Um, the, uh, um, but this whole idea that, the, that sexual abuse is committed by the stranger, by someone who is attacking, by the bad guy, um, the less prepared children are uh, for disclosure when it starts to happen to them or to understand the process of, uh, of how sexual abuse um, comes. Um, there's an entire grooming process in which uh, this, the perpetrator of childhood sexual abuse enters into a family and begins to gain trust. Um, show kindness, generosity, all of these things. So in the mind of the, of the victim of childhood sexual abuse, the perpetrator is not the bad guy because they've gained trust. They're generous, they're kind, that kind of thing. So that's one of the barriers that everyone experiences is how do I understand what this person did to me when this person is not a bad person in their mind? Um, Shame and guilt are universal experiences um, that adult male survivors and all survivors experience. Um, isolation and loneliness. Um, this is something that all survivors experience um, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, any kind of abuse, because one of, the, one of the tactics that abusers use is to isolate their victim. They, they want their victim to be alone, to feel lonely, because then the person feels like they don't have anyone to go, th go to. This is actually pronounced more in male survivors, um, and a lot of it has to do with the way that, that uh, we might uh, promote um, prevention, because a lot of our prevention material and a lot of uh, sexual assault, sexual abuse is committed uh, with female victims. However, male victims are almost as, as prevalent. Um, while we hear the statistic one in five, one in five females will be the victim of sexual assault or sexual abuse uh, in their lifetime, it's actually the number for male survivors is one in six. One in six males will be a, a, a victim of some kind of sexual abuse or sexual assault. But because so much of our literature focuses on male perpetrator, female, um, female victim, this sense of isolation can actually be pronounced because males are not seeing themselves represented as victims or survivors. So they begin to feel like, um, um, the absolutely, might be, uh, Jessica just said, might be uh, underreporting from them because of these barriers. That is absolutely true. Um, male sexual abuse is, is very highly underreported. Um, but uh, with, the, uh, with the isolation and loneliness, because they don't see themselves represented uh, in the literature when it comes to perpetration and abuse, um, then um, the, uh, then the, uh, uh, it, it becomes harder for them to, uh, Find, to, to disclose. Um, this, this question, um, uh, is this when shame can accrue? I think that shame comes in uh, um, throughout the entire process. Um, it, it would be hard to pinpoint exactly when shame comes in, but I mean, shame can, shame can begin to be experienced even before the uh, perpetrator 
commits an actual physical like genital penetration or anything like that. Um, because um, they will often, they'll do things like maybe provide alcohol and then the child feels ashamed for having drank alcohol or they might uh, view pornography with the child and the child feels ashamed for having viewed pornography. Um, so um, shame can come in and it can actually be one of the tools that a, that a perpetrator uses. Um, isolation and loneliness, which can actually be further pronounced for male survivors. Dependency on the abuser. Um, if the abuser is a primary provider for the family, whether it's a father, a grandfather, an uncle, but if they get much of their material resources, then disclosing doesn't just mean that the abuser is going to be sent, but um, there are uh, the disclosing could also mean that uh, that the financial stability, the living situation, the 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 uh, all of those things are. Um, are disrupted as well. And so if the family is dependent on the abuser for um, food, clothing, shelter, that can be a barrier to disclosure. And then the one thing we have to consider is that the victim may actually love the abuser, um, especially if it's a family member. Um, we, we need to understand that the abusers are not abusive all the time. And there's actually this grooming process that occurs where the uh, victim can become emotionally attached to the abuser. And so to disclose the abuse means to betray this person that I actually do care about. And um, that can add to the confusion and, um, and uh, disrupt the, um, um, the process of disclosure. We'll move, we'll move on from there. We're going to talk now about some of the barriers to disclosure that are specific to males. And there are three that I want to focus on. The first one is sexual orientation confusion. Again, the vast majority of perpetrators of childhood sexual abuse are male. And when they have chosen a male victim, there can be, um, uh, there can be sexual orientation confusion. And the reason is because when the body is sexually stimulated, the, the body is going to respond. Um, and when that happens, the person can begin to question, am I, uh, am I gay? Did I like it? Is that why I, uh, I allowed it in quotation marks to happen? Um, the person can experience the sexual orientation confusion where they, um, where they don't really know who they are in themselves. Um, one of the one of the individuals, one of the males that I interviewed for my study, discussed uh, described a sexual orientation that lasted through his teenage years, um, and uh, um, his abuse lasted from about the age of ten until about the age of fourteen. But it wasn't until he was about seventeen or eighteen years old that he he began to experience um, the uh, uh, heterosexual attractions. Um, so it kind of delayed his own sexual orientation development. Another one of the gentlemen that I abused, that I, um, <laughs> sorry about that, that I interviewed about his abuse, um, talked about how it was 20, he was in his 20s before his heterosexual attractions began to emerge. Um, the, um, uh, for this person, his abuse started when he was about 11 years old, and it continued well into his adulthood. He had graduated from high school and gone and joined the Army, and during this time, he continued to engage in homosexual activities um, with uh, soldiers that he was in the Army with that were in his unit. Um, he, would, he would do things to sexually gratify the men that he was in the Army with. It wasn't until he was discharged from the Army and had uh, moved about 600 miles from his abuser and began to live his own life where he began uh, to have heterosexual attractions emerge until he eventually uh, married and had a family of his own. So they, they can experience sexual orientation confusion that lasts well into their adulthood. Another um, 
another uh, barrier that is specific to men is the way that they conceptualize the abuse. And this is particularly true if the abuser was female, um, because um, the even in society, I remember watching Bill Maher one time, uh, uh, Politically Incorrect and all of those shows that he's hosted. And he was talking about how if a 35-year-old male has sex with a 16-year-old or 15-year-old female student, a male teacher has sex with a 16-year-old uh, or 15-year-old female student, that male teacher is going to prison. But if a 35-year-old female teacher has sex with a 15 or 16-year-old male student, everybody's given him high fives. And that's the way that our society conceptualizes abuse, uh, childhood sexual abuse, when it is female perpetrator to male. Um, that's, I would like to be able to answer that question, Amber, about does a woman who is groomed by a female have sexual orientation confusion as well? That was actually not a part of my research because I really did focus on uh, adult males. And so I would like to be able to answer that question, but I just can't right now. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, the, uh, but the whole idea of the conceptualization of the abuse, um, men tend, yep, absolutely, future study. <laughs> um, the uh, conceptualization of the abuse is, um, uh, is, um, so, is a barrier that can be specific to males because males tend not to conceptualize abuse unless it includes genital, that they don't conceptualize their experience as abuse unless it involves genital penetration and use of force. So other types of um, sexual contact between an adult and a, and a male child that doesn't involve genital penetration or use of force a male will conceptualize as something bad that happened to me or something that made me feel uncomfortable, but they tend not to use the words abuse. So that's something to be aware of when we're working with males. Um, the last one is vampire syndrome, which is very interesting. Those are the words that um, a colleague of mine who is a survivor, um, who is a colleague of mine who is a survivor used to describe this idea of the victim to offender narrative, which it was called in this research by Price Robertson from 2012. The victim to offender narrative is this. Um, we will often discuss um, the idea that the vast majority of perpetrators of sexual abuse were abused themselves as children. This can give the false impression that a survivor of childhood sexual abuse will become an abuser. And we need to be very careful when we're talking about that, because even if it is true, although there's some research starting to emerge that suggests that it's really not true, that, um, that the, mo the majority of perpetrators were once abused themselves, even if that were true, it is not true that just because someone is abused, they will become an abuser. And so uh, this whole idea of vampire syndrome, the person that uh, uh, my colleague who is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse uses this phrase vampire syndrome, because once you're bitten by a vampire, you become a vampire. And it is this idea. And he tells the story of a, of a, of a man that he worked with in his advocacy and mentorship work with other survivors that um, went so far as to have himself castrated out of fear that he was going to become an abuser. And so this is a very real fear. It's also a societal fear that, that um, we can inadvertently advance by using this narrative. And so we need to be very careful about that. Um, so the suspicion that exists um, uh, with those kinds of things. So, and, and it's very, very real. Um, what is the difference between a survivor acting out, trying to understand what happened, and someone who is actually becoming a perp? Um, that's a great question. You're asking really great questions. <laughs> um, I would say that's a question I really wasn't prepared to answer right now. 
it was also outside of the realm of my study, that's something I would really need to think about and that we can have a discussion about maybe towards the end and get some other people involved. Can we, uh, can we parking lot that question so, uh, so that uh, maybe we can address it towards the end? Okay, yeah, no problem, don't apologize. I love the questions. So um, we're gonna move forward here. Uh, Dr. Christopher Hip says the mentality behind the behavior and the length of time the occurrence is going on. I would say those are probably two really good indicators. So, all right, we're going to move forward. So, research on the experience of disclosure really started in the 1980s. Um, Summit uh, was the first in 1983 that really kind of tried to conceptualize this with what he called the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. And he described disclosure as a sequential process. Um, it starts with denial and secrecy. It moves into this sense of helplessness, accommodation to the abuser, and then this delayed and unconvincing disclosure. And then there's a recantation and then a reaffirmation of the disclosure. The important thing I want to, us to kind of take away from Summit's work is that this was really new. It was, and it was the first conceptualization of disclosure. And they thought of it as being a sequential process. And that's what I want us to take away from this particular slide, um, that they, when disclosure was first studied, it was studied as a sequential process. Um, later on, Sorensen and Snow looked at disclosure, and they still, in 1991, they kind of conceptualized it. So this is eight years after Summit's work. Um, but they believed it was more a spectrum of types within a sequence. And so you had denial, you had tentative disclosure, and then active disclosure, but it was still considered to be this um, this sequential process that a person went to went through. Um, Bradley and Wood, five years after Sorensen and Snow, began to think of disclosure. I'm going to move this. I don't know how many can see this chat window, but we're going to move it down here a little bit um, so that we can see what's going on here. Um, they began to see um, disclosure as more of a spectrum of types. So they began to, um, uh, they, they began to move away from the idea that there's this sequential process that people go through when they disclose. And rather, disclosure happens as a spectrum of types from denial and non-disclosure all the way through active disclosure. Um, so it was around the mid-90s that they began moving away from the idea of it being a sequential process. Um, whoops. And click back onto here. So um, Anderson in 2016, he's, he continued to refine this concept of disclosure. And so he began to look at it in terms of you have denial and non-disclosure, and then you have delayed disclosure and non-delayed disclosure, and then you have different types of disclosure. So we're still looking at it as types on a spectrum rather than as a sequential process. And so you can have delayed unintentional disclosure or delayed active disclosure. Um, this testing the waters is where you maybe say a few things. There were some things that made me feel uncomfortable, but yet they haven't completely disclosed everything at this time. Um, you have tentative disclosure and active disclosure. And so um, there's, there's these different types of disclosure that can exist on this. There's some problems with these. Uh, with these types of disclosure. Um, the first is that it interprets disclosure as unidirectional, that it's a one-way experience. The survivor is either not disclosing, it's a tentative disclosure, it's an active disclosure, it may be delayed, it may be immediate, but it's, it's the survivor basically giving information to the clinician. Um, the other problem with this is that it, um, all of these paradigms were defined in work with children. There is extraordinarily little research on um, the work with men or, or work with adults at all, understanding their experiences of disclosure. And so that's where my research came in. Um, so this is my research. Um, this was my dissertation title. Um, Adult Male Survivor's Disclosure of Childhood Sexual Abuse. My research question 
was how do adult male survivors of childhood sexual abuse understand their experiences of disclosure of the abuse to mental health professionals? <clears throat> Excuse me. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to look at adult male survivors um, specifically. They're, they're a highly understudied population. Um, the childhood sexual abuse, I, I defined that experience. One of the problems that we have when we talk about childhood sexual abuse is lack of operational definitions. Depending on where you are, the definition of uh, childhood sexual abuse can range wildly. And so there are some that define childhood sexual abuse as any kind of sexual interaction. It could be verbal, it could be watching pornography, it could be um, witnessing a sexual act. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. And then to the other side, there are some who will um, define uh, sexual abuse as only that which involved genital penetration. And so you have this extreme kind of spectrum. Um, also, you have different definitions depending on age range. And so you have things like Romeo and Juliet laws, which may prevent to, uh, may prevent reporting from uh, of childhood sexual abuse. You also have um, uh, a, a, you also have age ranges within children, whereas uh, a state may define childhood sexual abuse as only being able to. <clears throat> somebody posted the link there to my dissertation. That's very nice of you. I think that's my dissertation. Um, but uh, some people might. Uh, uh, some will define sexual abuse as um, only uh, as like if they're within five years, it's not really child sexual abuse. And so if you have a 13 year old and a 12 year old, they might not consider that child sexual abuse or a 15 year old and a 13 year old. And so. Um, <laughs> um, and so there's uh, there's a lot of different. Uh, um, uh, definitions there. So um, that's part of the, that's part. And then you also have the objective legal definitions, which vary widely from state to state, and subjective personal definitions. Um, and so there's all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of uh, um, differences in, in the definitions. And that makes it very, very difficult. For the purpose of my study, I define childhood sexual abuse as sexual abuse that began um, when the when the person was uh, uh, was prepubescent, so earlier than age twelve or earlier is how I defined that, and the perpetrator was an adult, age eighteen and over, because that is a more universally accepted definition of childhood sexual abuse. I wanted to make sure uh, I was looking at an experience that everyone would go, yes, that's childhood sexual abuse. Um, disclosure has to do with telling, and I wanted the person, the survivor, to be over age 18 before they disclosed to a mental health professional. So they may have disclosed to someone else earlier in their life, but they were over age 18 before they talked to a mental health professional. So those were some of the, um, also, the perpetrator of the abuse was a male. So I wanted to look at that specifically as well. And I used interpretative phenomenological analysis, the six-phase process, the way Jonathan Smith defined it um, in his book from 2009. <clears throat> so uh, moving forward, I'm going to share with you some of the themes that emerged um, from, the, uh, from my research. After doing the interviews and transcribing the interviews and doing the thematic analysis, there were four themes. That, that emerged. The first was alone and not alone, and that's kind of the superordinate theme uh, for this. I'm sorry, one second. <laughs> My throat's starting to get dry. Um, right, um, I didn't look at that specifically. Um, uh, the question about cases where young prebiescent children are abused by older, pre post, uh, older pubescent children, um, uh, because I wanted to pick a more universally defined uh, explanation. 
those are all topics when I, when I went through and said opportunities for further research, changing those kinds of variables um, uh, is certainly something that can be done in further research. Um, but these four themes, the, the subordinate theme, superordinate theme that, uh, that came out was alone and not alone. When these survivors were telling their stories, what came across um, uh, was this idea that this feeling of being alone and wanting to overcome their aloneness. Um, and so through that, they, there were some other things that emerged. The idea of throwing grenades. This was the way that one of the survivors that I spoke to described telling people. Uh, he was acutely aware of the emotional disruption that telling his story of abuse caused in other people. He was acutely aware of it, and he described it as throwing grenades in people's laps. Whenever he would disclose, he was throwing a grenade that would cause this disruption in the other person. One of the things that came out in the, in the study also was this idea of monsters in the deep. This also goes along with the alone and not alone theme. Many of the survivors described this idea, all, all of the survivors that I talked to described this idea of having this thing inside of them that they didn't understand. It was almost like this thing had a volition of its own. It had its own, um, its own will, its own behaviors, its own emotions, and it was deep inside of them. And what they were looking for was companionship to go into that deep place and confront this thing inside of them that they referred to. Um, the idea of monsters came out of their own language, um, monsters in the deep. And so they were looking for companionship to go into this deep place to confront these monsters that they saw inside of them, they described inside of them. Um, the last one was, that's not what I wanted. I was a little bit surprised by this one, but all three of the, um, or all of the, uh, three of the, folks that I interviewed described this experience of disclosing and then immediately having control taken away from them in the disclosure process and what the next steps were. So one of them described the, uh, that he, he had disclosed to his mother first and her immediate response, this, this gentleman had been abused by his grandfather. Her immediate res response was to call the grandfather, call up all of his aunts and cousins, and bring them all together and confront the grandfather. He, and he says, I didn't really want to do that, but that's immediately what happened. For the other one, it was actually uh, another one. Um, it was actually um, the therapist that took control and wanted to confront the abuser. So they went online. And looked, up who, and looked up the perpetrator of his abuse and found where the person was. And he was eventually able to talk the therapist out of this confrontation. So there was no, uh, there was no confrontation. Um, but the therapist immediately took that control. And in the third one, uh, a third one um, this gentleman disclosed that he had been sexually abused, but the therapist decided that the alcohol use that the person presented with was a more important problem. And so the, uh, I'm glad I'm getting these kinds of reactions <laughs> in the chat. Um, but the therapist decided that the al al alcohol abuse that the person, that the gentleman presented with was a more immediate problem. And so referred him and sent and talked him into going um, uh, to, uh, to an alcohol treatment program, an inpatient alcohol treatment program for 30 days. Um, he says, that's not what I wanted. I, all three of them said, that's not what I wanted to happen afterwards. So just imagine that these men who were disempowered because of the abuse, their power had been taken away from them. They disclosed the abuse and immediately have their own preferences and, um, and, uh, uh, and desires taken away from them again, their own power taken away from them again by the person they're turning to for help. Um, this was a common experience for them. So um, 
um, again, is the key word. That's absolutely right. It is a re-traumatization for them, uh, making them feel powerless again. Um, so those are, the, those are the four themes that kind of emerged. Understanding these things all together, exp um, disclosure for um, these adult survivors is not a linear process. And that's, I, I, I want us to move away from this idea that it's linear and one directional, that the survivor is just telling a story to this passive recipient. Um, what's actually happening in disclosure is a very relational and cyclic event. And so the survivor has this desire for this affirmative relationship, for this companionship, right? And, and so they're telling the story, they're throwing grenades, they're inviting for, they're, they're asking for companionship for monsters in the deep. They're seeking empowerment in their disclosure. And the clinician's response uh, can go one of two ways. If it's an imbalanced affective reaction, and that imbalance could go either way, right? Um, imbalanced affective reaction. Absolutely. Disclosure is about validation and connection. That's a great insight there. Um, but it's, if it's imbalanced either way, so if the, if the uh, clinician is sitting there passive and doesn't react at all, the person is acutely aware of what's happening with the clinician. So if they don't see any reaction at all, they can interpret that as rejection or that it doesn't matter to this person. And so some kind of reaction is necessary in order for the person to feel that they've been heard. Um, so it, the, the, it, there has to be a balanced affective reaction in which the clinician owns their own. You know, uh, what you're saying to me, so as a clinician, I might respond, what you're saying to me is really upsetting, but I want you to know that it's me feeling upset and not, and not, uh, and not uh, that your story is overwhelming to me. Um, they're telling a horrible story. There should be some kind of reaction. We're human beings, right? If we dismiss, minimize, ignore, if we disempower, we have created a roadblock for that connection, that validation. However, if our response is, um, absolutely, this is why we all must do our own work so we can hear these stories. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, in this relational model, we often open ourselves up to vicarious traumatization. So we have to be doing our own work to make sure that if we do are experiencing vicarious traumatization, we're not imposing that on the clients that we're working with. Um, we're going to parking lot that question about male clients who seem ambivalent about disclosing. Um, well, no, we don't have to. The whole idea is that disclosure is, is going to happen over time. It's a cyclic process. And so as the client is met, they're going to disclose the amount that they want to disclose when they want to disclose it. And so if we meet them with this balanced affective reaction, with companionship, collegiality, and with empowerment, that's going to evoke more disclosure. And so it becomes the cyclic process. The clinician is not a passive uh, recipient, but an active participant in the act of disclosure. The clinician is an active participant in the disclosure. And so when a client is ambivalent about disclosing, that's okay. They're disclosing the amount that they are comfortable disclosing when they are comfortable disclosing it. And as long as we can meet them with that balanced affective reaction, companionship, collegiality, and empowerment, that will evoke more disclosure so that it becomes this process. <clears throat> so um, we've got some motivational interviewing coming out in the comments over here. So that's great. Um, um, I, I, I would be very happy. I'm going to put my email address here. Um, 
If you would like the slideshow, shoot me an email address. Shoot me an email and ask for them. I'm very happy to uh, share them with you. Thank so. you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, so just understanding the to shifting the paradigm from the idea that uh, um, that uh, disclosure is a is a linear and unidirectional activity in which the clinician um, there you go uh, in which the disclosure is a unidirectional linear activity to um, a uh, uh, a relational and cyclic event that builds on itself. So the more affirming we are, the more balanced our reaction, the more we offer companionship through the process, the more empowerment we're able to offer, the further the disclosure will, uh, will advance. This helps us break down the barriers of this aloneness. Um, we need to work on training our clinicians on how to better participate in disclosure rather than to simply receive it. Um, and uh, we can engage in public action to raise awareness for, of male survivors. Um, as we go back to our own clinical settings, one of the things I would invite you to do is just take a critical look at um, the, um, um, the, at your office, where you have material for sexual assault, sexual abuse, um, how much of it is directed towards males? Um, so um, just, uh, just kind of take a look at that. Um, there are lots of materials out there um, that are available about male disclosure um, and, and the male experience. Um, so, um, but just to take a look at those things, what kind of posters do we have hanging in our offices? Simple things like that can help break down um, uh, the uh, can help break down the um, I, I do have recommendations but they are they just went right out of my head because probably specifically because you asked Brian <laughs> so um, let me think about that and I'd be happy to email those out too um, there's a, a book um, I think it's called what's it called what to do when someone you love was abused. I think that's what it's called. So, um, but uh, all of these things, I will be happy to send those kinds of resources out. But looking specifically at, uh, um, at, at how we are doing, how we are publicizing and talking publicly about sexual abuse. Is our language inclusive? Is our sexual education inclusive of male experiences? So these are all things to just to take into account when we're doing this to help break down those barriers of aloneness. Um, I think that's it. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions, have, have conversation. Um, Amber, the one question that you asked, which is way up in the chat line now, we could probably return to at this time if you wanted to ask again, but uh, I'm very happy to, uh, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and get back into the bigger one here. Um, so anyone that would like to ask questions, or we have probably about five, five, 10 minutes, I think. What, what was your drive in choosing this topic for your dissertation? Like what, what sprouted your passion? Um, I, uh, I have a I have a colleague who I consider to be also a good friend. Uh, his name is his name. He doesn't mind me. Uh, he's very open. He's actually a, a nationally known public speaker, and he is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. His name is Greg Holtmeyer. Um, he's a mentor and uh, has worked with many men who have uh, who have survived. Like I said, he's a survivor himself. He um, he asked me um, probably five years ago um, to help him find research uh, to kind of help uh, his, because he does great, he does some great work 
uh, in terms of public speaking and that type of thing, but he didn't have a lot of research to back up uh, kind of his own personal experience. He would tell his story, but he wanted to add a research component to it. So I began helping him do research, and that's when I began to learn or began to realize that there really is very little research on um, uh, ad adult experiences and specifically adult male survivors' experiences of child sexual abuse and disclosure. And so just trying to fill that research gap has been kind of, has become kind of a passion for me. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of where it came from was my work with, with an adult male survivor um, who, who was looking for more information. And that's where it kind of sparked for me. So. Um, I think my question, if I remember it, cause it was all the way up was, I guess I should wear it probably a different way was what are some warning signs um, between somebody who like a male survivor who is trying to understand what is going on with them? Like, for example, maybe like a, um, in his adolescence, he may have experimented trying to understand or even voice his disclosure versus somebody who has is at risk of becoming a perpetrator, if that makes sense. Some of it has to do with when we get into a, a perpetrator's frame of reference. A perpetrator, you know, um, abuse and any type of abuse. It's not just sexual abuse. Physical abuse, financial abuse, religious abuse, um, the uh, sexual and, and of course sexual abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse. It's always about power and control. And so those are the kinds of things that for me would be red flags that someone is engaging in some type of abusive behavior. Um, trying to understand a person's body and inclinations is going to sound different than somebody who is expressing frustration because people are, are, are out of their control. And so um, that's, that's kind of the things, the red flags that I would look for is how is this person responding to the stress of, um, of things that are not within their control? I don't know if that makes sense or if that's no, that satisfactory. Does. But that so it's almost like listening to the certain vocabularies, maybe how they carry themselves when they're disclosing or discussing it. it it's the reading between mm -hmm. the lines. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, someone asked, how do we balance safety of working on trauma while someone is using substances so they can get the help they need without disempowering them? We have to make sure that we're offering them the choice of how they want to proceed in their treatment. Um, we can offer options, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid of offering options and kind of explaining our own reasoning. If we're wanting to make a recommendation for, <clears throat> for substance abuse treatment, for example, um, uh, to be able to make, make an argument for that, but always leaving it to their choice. Um, it's always going to be the client's choice because they're the ones that will be empowered to make the decision. And if they make the decision to go to substance use treatment, awesome. But they should never feel like we're trying to talk them into it, uh, trying to take the choice away from them. So um, we can make recommendations for treatment, but at the end of the day, it always has to be the client's choice about how they want to proceed next. So. There's some, uh, James asked about emerging research on perpetrators not having a history of victimization. They're doing this through, and you can take this with a grain of salt, however you feel about like the whole lie detector test kind of thing. But one of the things that they're, ask, that they're doing is researching and uh, using these um, uh, lie detector tests to, um, to try to determine whether a person's self-report of their history is accurate or not. And so it, it's, it's emerging, it's brand new. Um, I've only seen maybe one or two studies with it. Um, I didn't even include that really <clears throat> in my own dissertation because it is just so new. I'm not real sure about it yet, but that's, that's some of that, uh, that's how some of that is coming apart. Uh, people that were saying that they were sexually abused 
they're hooking them up to lie detectors basically and asking them to tell their story. So um, you can take that for what it's worth. Um, so. Hey James, I'll share something uh, related to disclosure that I think is important. Uh, I am a survivor sure. of CSA and it took me over 40 years to disclose and what it took was another trauma and facing mortality. Um, so I think that happens, you know, probably too frequently and then you have two traumas to deal with. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, God love you for disclosing to us here. Uh, that's, that's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, it is actually, for, for adult male survivors, waiting 20, 30, 40 years is actually the norm. Uh, the vast majority of adult of male survivors will wait well until adulthood before they disclose. Um, for, um, for, I want to say, all of the gentlemen that I interviewed, the catalyst for disclosing was that not alone piece that somehow the barrier to that aloneness broke down. And for many of them, it was, uh, it was a conversation with another survivor. And it may not have been a, a male survivor. For one, it was a conversation he had with a, with a female survivor of uh, sexual assault. And so, um, but those are uh, breaking down those barriers of the alone and not alone um, actually helps. So, so that companionship, that uh, collegiality, that sense of connection um, can evoke more disclosure. So, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you very much. Sure. It's interesting you say that too, because uh, I was in kind of a distressed situation and the first therapist that I saw he, you know, there's so much debate about self-disclosure and he disclosed to me that he is also a survivor and he shared his feelings and it just like took the weight of the world off my shoulders that uh, I wasn't the only one. And that really did so much for me. And he disclosed for the right reasons. He disclosed for me. So um, it's interesting that, that you say that. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, being able to align ourselves make that connection, um, however that connection is made. Like I said, the, the connection doesn't have to be with another survivor. If the connection is made, it will evoke further disclosure. So just breaking down that barrier of that aloneness that, that survivors feel. And thank you for sharing that. That's a beautiful testimony. And I, I just really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Getting some getting some affirmations of that of that idea in the uh, in the chat right now. So, so I I had a question. Um, my question just goes for like I've seen clients that they overly share or like will be in a group setting because um, I do run groups and it seems like they they want to they the person wants people to know that they've been traumatized and they've been, um, you know, sexually assaulted or they're a survivor. Um, and it happens in, in times where it would not be considered appropriate. I guess, how would you navigate that when you want to be supported, support the client, but also you are running a whole group? Does that, does that make sense? I guess what I'm asking mm -hmm. is um, how, do, how does one go about it without dismissing or having the person feel like I should have never said that or should never disclose um, what happened to the person? I think my immediate response would be to uh, uh, thank the person for disclosing it. And then, um, re and then if, it's, if it's really an inappropriate moment, um, the, um, it, it within the group is to redirect to the group purpose, affirm the person for disclosing, and then redirect to the purpose of the group 
while with the promise that that's something that you can return to with that person um, in individual therapy, and then make sure you follow through on that. So um, I, I think that that's probably, and I don't know, other, other clinicians here might handle it differently. You're asking for kind of my opinion, but I'm sure that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of experts on, on the thing here that might be able to. So if anybody else uh, wants to jump in, um, so, uh, but that's a great, that's a great question. It's a real life situation. So. So I'm yeah. an intern, so all of this is just new to me all the time. So when I'm getting it, it's just like my instincts are these things, but you know, I just wanted to see what other people would do in that, in those kind of situations. Mm -hmm. I actually, oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, just a related question with, in regard to inappropriate places. There are some clients that I've met who will just disclose it to anyone because they're seeking that validation, but they're doing it with like in the supermarket or acquaintances of their spouse that they just met. And I'm, I'm struggling with how to balance showing them that it's okay to to disclose and all that and not reinforcing what they've been taught but also you know talking about it in the pet store might not be the most appropriate place with someone that you just met and who like shake your hand kind of level of just met um i i don't know that i would i would discourage the the disclosure i think what i would do is help them process the reactions because people are going to react differently yeah. and i think that over a process um it's really interesting i didn't really mention this because of time um and i see that it's 10:58 right now so i don't want to go very much but i would encourage you to read the dissertation if you if you have time to read a 170 yeah, page document <laughs> <laughs> the uh, but uh, the the i talked one of one of my interviewees talked about stigmatizing himself in his disclosure Mm -hmm. And it was a process of learning when and how to disclose. And so that's how I would take that. Um, I would, I would uh, certainly affirm their disclosure, but then I would help them process other people's reactions. Yeah, and maybe you. in that, they will, learn, uh, they will learn disclosure. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just as we Dr. are- Dr. Christopher or something. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, just as we're closing, for anybody um, wanting to receive CEs, they must complete the CE evaluation by April 19th at the latest to get the credit. The link for that evaluation form is on the last page of our program. I actually went to go do that for an earlier one, and it said that the survey didn't exist. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. Okay, thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. We'll, we'll make sure and get that fixed. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. You're awesome. Thank you. Great yeah. group. Yeah. You too, thank you. Stay healthy, everyone. You too. Grace, are we okay to start?